evening. It's just barely past 6.30 and we're going to go ahead and get started and we're going to have our flag salute first. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's nice to see all of you here this evening. I'm Jane Ward. I'm the president of the Sumner County Historical and Geneal Genealogical Society. And we have a really good crowd out here tonight. It's wonderful. Um, oh, Sherry's going to talk about next month's program. Are you wanting me up there? Yeah, okay. we're ready. Did you ask about Sedgwick County? No. Well, some of the song back in Well, well, the name's kind of in Century County. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, I, before we start in, I, I wanted to mention our next program. We have one of our speakers for next month here tonight, Amber Countryman. She and Jim Bales from the Chisholm Trail Museum will be talking about Drury. And the title of it, uh, Amber gave me the title, Playground of Kansas and Oklahoma. It may sound kind of crazy, a little town that's practically not there anymore, but once upon a time it had a big hotel and a lot of people rode the train from even Wichita would come down and swim and boat and play and stay in the 46, 46 room? 46 mm -hmm. room. Oh. Hotel that washed away in the 1923 flood. Amber and I were talking this afternoon. So we, we'd like for you to come back on Monday, May the 15th. That'll be a week before Memorial Day. And we really want to thank and welcome the private John Eckes, Sons of the Union Veterans Group from Winfield, Kansas tonight. This group is the newest SUVCW camp in Kansas, and we're so glad that they've agreed to come speak to us tonight. There's three guys here tonight, Terry Justice, Joe Christmas, Chrisman, and Eric Crittenden, and Joe is going to give our talk, right Joe? And he is a retired sexton for three cemeteries in the city of Winfield. So he's got a lot of experience at doing this. And our own sexton from Wellington is here tonight, uh, James, here in the corner, who probably was wishing I hadn't mentioned his name. <laughs> but he's a really good guy from the from Fairy Lawn and Pioneer Cemetery. So we want to thank you all for coming and welcome Joe and his group. this brief so we can get out to the cemetery and, and do what we came to do. I uh, apologize for my attire, but I'm not going to wear my, my khaki pants to go get dirty in the cemetery. So we'll get this started. Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War were the legal heir and representative of the Grand Army of the Republic. We were originally named Sons of Veterans and founded in November of 1881, officially changed the name to the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. 1925, and in 1954, the United States Congress officially chartered the SUBCW as a patriotic heritage organization. <clears throat> we are, our camp is named after John N. Eckes. He, uh, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for gallantry in the charge of the Volunteer Storm, Storming Party, Vicksburg, Mississippi, 22 May, 1863. It's called the uh, the forlorn hope, and only single men were asked to step forward to go on this mission. And they had to turn away several, several men, you know, every, everybody wanted on this mission. It, it was an important mission. Uh, he was with the 47th Ohio Infantry, and he is buried at Union Grand Cemetery over in Winfield. We are a volunteer, charitable, fraternal, and educational organization. We promote patriotism and good citizenship, education, honor, and the preservation of Civil War memorials and monuments, Grand Army of the Republic records. 
We help preserve and protect Civil War artifacts where we can. We, we, we spend a lot of time in battlefield preservation and burial locations of veterans. We try to keep, we try to find everyone we can. And we also try to ensure that every veteran's grave is marked with a Civil War marker. We are dedicated in keeping green the memory of the boys who wore the blue or, or boys in blue. That's, that's, in my opinion, that's why we're here, so we don't forget these guys. One of the things we like to do is rededicate Grand Arm of the Republic monuments. The one on the left is Ark City Riverview Cemetery. The one in the middle is over at Oxford. We rededicated, that was our first rededication a couple years ago. And the one on the right is the top of the, the monument, or the, yeah, the monument at, at uh, Ark City. It, it is quite an impressive monument. We like to get out on Veterans Day and participate in a few activities. The photo on the left is the Veterans Day Parade in our city. The photo on the right is the service at Memorial Block. And you know, we, we only have a few guys that show up to most events, so we are spread kind of thin. And uh, we're like every other civic organization around. You just can't get the younger people interested in, in joining and volunteering to go out and do this stuff. We support the Eagle, Staff, Eagle Scouts. Eric Crittman over here, he is the coordinator for our camp, and he is also the, the Department of Kansas coordinator. So if you know of any, any Eagle Scout, that would like us to come, I believe it's called the Court of Honor, isn't it? If, if they would like us to come to the Court of Honor, we will give them a certificate and also a patch bearing Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War so they can wear on their uniform. And we'd be more glad to, to come over here and do it if, if, if requested. Memorial Day, that's the important one. Uh, like many of you, I grew up calling it uh, uh, what what'd you say? Decoration. Decoration Day, yes, I lost that thought for a minute. But uh, this is over at Highland, and for 26 years, I helped put up the flags over there, and I helped take them down. The, the photo in the center is one of my daughters with all my grandkids. I like to get them out there with me to help take the flags down so I can you know, tell them about proper flag etiquette and why we why we have Memorial Day and what it used to be called. And you know, I tell them what we did when I was a kid on Decoration Day. We would go out the day of or the day before and with mowers and trimmers and flowers, just like a lot of you have done in the past, and, and make sure that our veterans' graves look very you know very good. One of the things we do on a regular basis is clean headstones, or I, I, I prefer to call them Civil War military markers. And what they are, they're the, the VA issued markers that you see out in the cemeteries for, for veterans. And the first rule in cleaning headstones and military markers is do no harm. There are so many people out there that get out there, they think they know what they're doing, and they, they don't do a very good job. They actually end up causing a lot of harm. Do not use ever, ever, ever bleach, wire brushes, grinding wheels, power washers, dish soap, chalk, shaving cream, sandpaper, sanding blocks. And if you get on the internet, you will find guys that go out with, with round sanding discs. They put them on, on cordless drills and they go out there and they just scar the heck out of those stones. Yes, it does make them look better for a short time, but the, the marble markers, they develop a skin, just like, just like what we have. If you take that skin off, then the markers will not last very long. You know, acid rain, the environment, pollution will, 
will tear the, the marble markers apart. So don't ever use any of that stuff. Why can you use wooden scrapers? And what that is, the scrapers made of wood. It is not scrapers to use on the side of a wood house you know, to get the paint off. I just want to make that very clear. There are scrapers made of wood, chopsticks. I, I say chopsticks, I got some here in my bucket, and they are good for getting in and around the lettering on a marker or the intricate detail on some marble headstones. Works very well getting the, the biological growth out, out of all them little places. A natural bristle brush, and what I'm talking about there, That's all you need right there. You don't need a fancy nylon bristle brush. That, that suffices. It won't, it won't tear the, the, the marble up. It's not doing anything to my arm. But uh, you want to use a natural bristle brush. The next one seems kind of odd, orderless livestock soap. And I have never used it, but a lot of your conservators they recommend you use it because it is a non-ionic solution and it will not hurt limestone or marble or granite. It is not a, a uh, very strong soap because you know, you're going to use it on your animals. So you don't want a strong soap on your animals. Same way with your markers. Take a handheld mirror with you to the cemetery and use it to reflect the light from the sun onto the front of the stone. And a mirror will help you read markers that are very hard to read otherwise. A cell phone. Take a, take a picture of the cell phone, blow it up, and you can really zoom in on some of that lettering that you're having trouble reading. Little elbow grease. That's all, that's all you need to clean a, head, a marker. And uh, you don't need to scrub hard. You don't need to scrub long, just long enough to kind of penetrate that biological growth to where the, the, the solution that I'm going to show you will work the best on. Uh, we, we carry, or I carry a two gallon sprayer. I carry, I try to carry two of them. And one of them is for water, just plain, plain clean water. And the other one is for a product called D2 Biological Solution. And you mix it 50-50. So I've got a two gallon sprayer. I'll take my gallon of D2, dump it in the two gallon sprayer, fill it up with water, dump it in the two gallon sprayer, shake it up a little bit. And this 50-50 solution works just as good as full strength. When I started using this stuff well over 10, 15 years ago, that's what they recommended. They recommended that you cut it 50-50, but now that everybody's wanting to get out and clean headstones, they say to use a full strength. Well, they want you buying more of it is why. <laughs> but 50-50 works well. I have also experimented with 75% water, 25% D2, and it worked, it just took a lot longer. But the 50-50 mix works just as good as full strength, if not better, I think. Where, where do you get that at? I've never even heard of it. Uh, if, if you can you know, run a computer, look it up, you know, search D2 Biological Solution. So it's something you basically have to order online and not, yes. not purchase locally? No. no uh, you might be able to find it local, but I, I seriously doubt if you would. Uh, you could try, but on, on one of those papers, I wrote down the name of the company that I get it from. I get it from Atlas, uh, what's the name of it? Preservation. Atlas Preservation. And the reason I get there is the guy who came up with this, he owns Atlas Preservation, John Abel. He is one of the best conservators in the United States. Jonathan Abel is his name. And I, I think he kind of owns the trademark of this, and he sells it through his store. You can get it, order it uh, from Amazon, 
but you're going to pay a little bit more. And if you open an account, if you're going to get out and really do this, you can open an account with him, and the more you buy, it gets a little cheaper. He'll give you discounts on it. But that's, that's where we get it. That's where I've always gotten it was from uh, Atlas Preservation. And they're, they're great people to work with. Uh, the two methods, I'm going to show you three at the cemetery. The two methods are the spray and walk away method, which is the easiest. You just walk up to a marker, spray it to the point of runoff. You have to spray liberally. You just don't want to go kind of barely get it wet, but to the point of runoff, walk away, don't even look at it, because it will scare you the first time you use this stuff on a white marble marker. The first time I used it, I bought, I think, five gallons of this. I went up to Union Grand Cemetery Winfield. I walked through and I sprayed every white marble marker I could find. When I was done, I thought, oh, I'll drive back through and look at it. It scared me because the D2 starts working immediately on the biological growth. And so some of my markers were a dark gray, some of them turned red, some of them turned green. I mean, it, it just depends on the biological growth and how the D2 reacts to it. And I don't know if you had that experience with it yourself. Yeah, yeah. There was over at Granola at at Greenlawn Cemetery. I was over there last year and I walked through and sprayed some of them. That's where I got some ancestry buried as well. And there was one that it turned really dark clay red like Oklahoma clay. It turned that red. I don't know what biological growth was on that stone, but it, it turned a shade of red I'd never seen before. I went back through a couple weeks later. It was fine. So I, I really thought I was going to lose my job the first time I ever sprayed this stuff. <laughs> it, it scared me, and I thought, I better go research. So I went back to my office and, and looked it up, and it will discolor a stone for a short amount of time. And at the end, it doesn't leave streak, streaks or anything? No, it does not etch. You know, it, there are some products out there that you use. It'll tell you to start at the bottom and work your way up, kind of like your grandma told you when you're cleaning cupboards. Don't start at the top because it'll streak and it'll etch your covers. Same thing with some of them other products. It will etch a stone. D2 will not etch a stone. And Bob, they, you know, we get a lot of wind, so when you spray that, the dust, the dirt, the grass, things like that get on there, that doesn't affect anything? No. D2 is only good, and I, I should have said this earlier, it is only good for the biological growth. If you have a stone out there that's got a lot of dirt on it or a lot of clay or anything like that, it will not, it will not clean. Your, your brush might clean it a little bit, but the D2 only cleans biological growth. That's where that Orbis livestock soap comes in. You can get some of that, mix it in a little hand sprayer, and that will clean dirt and grime off of the headstone. Uh, the second method, takes a little bit more time. I'm lazy, I, I like the spray and walk away method. And, uh, but it takes a lot more of this D2. The, the best way to do it when you're on a budget is to wet the marker down with water, plain water. Take a scraper, that's my scraper right there, about any piece of wood you have out in your garage, that's, that's oak. That's what I like to use because it is softer than the marble you're going to be scraping. And so just take a block of wood, spray it with water, take a block of wood. You don't have to gouge the stone. Just take it, run, run, run that down the front and the sides and the back of your stone. You don't have to be hard. Then you take your brush, just nice and gentle circular motions. A lot of people want to try to get that stuff off, so they're going to be scrubbing back and forth. There's no need for that. Just nice, gentle circular motion will we'll clean the biological growth enough to uh, so the D2 
two will penetrate. Once you're done scraping and brushing, take your water, rinse everything off the stone, all the D2, all the everything you scraped off. Let it dry for just a minute. Then you take your D2, spray the stone to a point of runoff, and walk away. And that, that method takes a little bit longer, but it doesn't take as much D2 to clean the stone. D2, that gallon there, what about $43 now plus shipping. When, when I first started buying it, it was $40 a gallon. And you know, when, when COVID hit, it went up just like everything else. $45.95. Is that what it is now? I've been a normal vendor, but yeah, somewhere in there. Unless you get more, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like he said, five and five gallons is a price that's down. They also have a 55 gallon drum. Yeah, yeah I saw that. 40 or 55 gallon drum. So. <laughs> that's painful. Right. Now, I want to say that we do not work for D2. We do not get a commission for being up here telling you this is what you need to use. It's just the best product out there. And I, before I had internet in my office, I did all the things you weren't supposed to do. I used bleach, I used a wire brush, I, I did everything you wasn't supposed to do because I didn't know any better. But once I got hooked up to internet in my office, and that's been about 20, that was between 20 and 25 years ago, once I got that internet, I started researching and I, I started doing it right. And yes, sir. Do you ever go back and spray it again and spray it off the way? You can do that twice a year. Twice no year. more. Yeah. And uh, you know, I I don't know why they say that, but weather conditions. weather conditions. If it's a nice cloudy day, no wind, that's the best time to get out there and, and spray walk away because it's not going to evaporate. On a day like today, we're probably going to get out there and it's probably going to evaporate on us rather quickly. So you also want to, I think it's above 56 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't want to use it below that. And of course, it, you want to give it 24 to 48 hours without rain. What, what kind of materials did they use on the CW markers, Civil War markers? Because obviously, the materials we're using, they're using nowadays wasn't available back then, I wouldn't think. It's all white marble. Is that what you're asking? What the, the stones back are made out of? Pardon me? Back in the Civil War days? Well, uh, you know, they probably just used wood, wood crosses back then. But, uh, you know, af after the Civil War, I I'm not sure when the, the first marker was made. But this, but this work, wood or marble or whatever materials? Yeah, right. you, can, you, can, you can spray this stuff on wood, you can spray it on marble, limestone, okay. granite, all that stuff. Okay, I kind of already explained all of them. That's the two different ways that, that you can use this product. Now I'm going to show you some before and after photos. This is this is method number one, spray and walk away. And on the left, it had been like that for many, many years. I sprayed the what not I sprayed the D2 on that stone, walked away, and in six months time that's what it looked like. Wow. And I try I would try to go back at least another once during the year sometime and just hit everything again. And uh, I tell you, I, I walked through, the first thing I did was, was all the military markers. I got all them done. And then I went through and I started getting all the white marble markers, just these tablets like, like what's up on the screen right now. I did all them. Then I went through and I started getting the, the gray, gray marble markers because then things get a lot of biological growth on them. And after about five years, I, I drove into my cemetery one day, and I was just amazed on all the white shining at me as soon as I went through the gate. <coughs> all the white marble was, was nice and clean, and it, it, it looked really nice. There's another one, method one, just spray and walk away. It's, it's actually right next door to the, 
the other one in the space right to the north of the, the first one I showed you. But, uh, it, pardon me? Yeah, those are single applications waiting six months. You know, it's, it's kind of like watching the grass grow or paint dry. And, you know, you're not going to see it happen, but if you forget about it, go back through one day, six months, three months later even, and you'll, you'll notice a difference. This one, I was, I was proud to have done. I did this about two months before Memorial Weekend one year. It's at, at Union Grand Cemetery. I was walking through, I thought, I'm going to get that stone. It looks pretty bad. So I got it. I forgot about it. I was up there the Saturday before Memorial Weekend doing a little bit of work. And this, this older guy came up to me. Oh, he must have been 79 or 80. And he said, did you do something to this stone? And again, I thought, oh, I'm going to get my rear beat for doing something I probably shouldn't have. And I said, yes, sir. I sprayed it down with, with D2. And he had tears in his eyes. He said that's the first time in his 80 years on this earth that he'd been able to read that stone. It was his great, great grandfather, I believe. Oh, wow. And so, you know, it, that, that made it all worth it. You know, hearing what he had to say about the stuff. This is method two. This is these are this is a stone that we went in, we sprayed, we put a brush on it and scraped, and that was about a month after the one on the right. That's the after, just after a month. And so, yeah, I think I think using a brush and scraping helps speed it up. And it doesn't take as much D2 for you to see the results. There's another one. This is up at, over at Tannehill Cemetery between Winfield and our city. And uh, they hadn't cut the, the little blue stem, I think, or big blue stem, whatever that is, for years in front of that marker. So we cut that down. We scraped. We, we brushed. We treated. And I went back about a month later and took that photo on the right. And it just, it's a, it's a world of difference. This is a GAR monument over at Sedan Cemetery, Sedan, Kansas. I, I actually have two great, great grandfathers that fought in the Civil War that they're, they're buried no more than about 75 yards, both of them, from this monument. So I, I wanted to do something kind of in, in, in their memory. And so we went over there what, twice so far, and we have raised and straightened a lot of the military markers over there. But we wanted this monument to look good for this coming Memorial Weekend. And we're gonna to try to get over there next month and, and finish up raising and straightening. And we're gonna make sure this monument looks good for their Memorial Day service. Cemetery work days, something I, I still enjoy getting out and doing. I can't do it like I did 20 years ago, but I'd rather be out working in a cemetery than talking to you guys right now even. I, that, to me, that's the epitome of being in San Jean better as a Civil War, getting out and making sure these guys are remembered like this. And the photo on the left is two of our brothers, and, and as you can see, they're, they're, they both got pieces of wood, and that's what they're scraping the stone with. And then we brushed it and sprayed it down. The, the photo on the right is a marker lift. I kind of stole the idea from something I'd seen on the internet. And the company that makes something like this, they wanted about $3,000 for, for their lift. And well, I, I came up with a whole different type of a clamping system and a buddy of mine helped me weld that up, but we use this a lot when we're, we're straightening and, and raising headstones. A lot of people like to use the A-frames, you know, a three-legged system with a, with a uh, winch on the end of it, a chain winch, hoist. To me, that's dangerous. I don't like being underneath that thing because I'm afraid it'll come down on my head. But I came up, this popped into my head. I told a friend of mine, he welded it up and, and it works just great. 
Here's an example of that left bin used. The photo on the left is the before. The photo in the middle is the lift. And I only have, we only had two legs on that day. I finally figured out that you can, you can use it with two uh, winches or uh, jacks instead of all four. Sometimes all four jacks come in handy, but if you can walk up the stone and kind of wiggle it, we know that, that the two jack system will work. And we had that up out of the ground within a few minutes. The nice thing about using that lift also is you don't have to do a lot of digging around that stone in order to get it up out of the hole. It, 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 it pulls it up nice and slow and it's safe. You're not gonna, you're not gonna harm the stone using this type of a lift. And basically when it's like that, we just pull it up out of the ground, put some gravel in it, slide it back in, and that's the end result on the right. This is another lift. I, I think I got this idea from concrete barriers on the highway. I don't know if you've ever seen how they set those, but they got a scissor lift. So they can put that scissor lift in the middle of the concrete barrier, and when they go to lift that lift, the lift, the clamp clamps around the, the barrier and picks the barrier up. And I thought, there ought to be a way to make something like that work with these. So that's just two befores, and it's kind of a, a scissor lift, and it, when, when it's really dry out, July, August, you know, the ground pulls back away for these markers. I mean, you can almost wiggle them around the, in, in the hole they're in. Take this jack, scissor jack, slide it down over the top, and two guys can pull it up out of the ground with ease. And again, we don't have to spend a lot of time digging around these things in order to get them out of the ground. You ever had trouble with one of them breaking or cracking? No, we've only used it twice, I think, so far, but they're pretty solid. And, you know, even if it did crack, you know, it's just a two before, so uh, it's, it's really easy to replace a part on that. So it, it, it works great. So how do you get it back in? Just okay. slide it right back down in the hole it came out of. Is there a measurement of how deep they're supposed to be? Yeah, you want to, and I got this from the, the veteran cemetery over Winfield. He said you want a, a military marker 24 to 26 inches high up out of the ground. And I asked him why 24 to 26, and he said, well, you know, you get, you get rolling ground like that, you can adjust them stones when you put them in from 24 to 26 to where when you're done with the line of rows, you can step back and the tops of them are, are in line with each other. And then how much is down below the ground? Uh, 18, 16 to 18 inches, it's depending on how high you set them. And, you know, we, at first, we used to take tape measures out and, and stick in the ground and measure, but then I thought, well, we just need a, a, a stick to carry around with us, so I, I put measurements on the stick. You know, if, if you ever want to find an easy way to do a job, have a lazy man do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, how I, that's how I explain everything that comes up out of, out of this head. So. Anyway, uh, at this point, I'm going to have Brother Eric. He's going to talk a little bit about his family that helped settle Wellington, right? Well, those early pioneers. Yes. Early pioneers. Yeah. All right, I'll turn it over to him now. One more thing. When you're spraying that uh, D2, do they recommend you wear some kind of respiratory uh, protection? No, I, like that? I wear safety glasses, but... There is another product out there called Wet and Forget. And I will admit, I used it back in the day before I had internet and I could research the stuff. There is, if you look at the MSDS reports, the material safety data sheets uh -huh. on, on the Wet and Forget and compare it to the D2, the D2 is a lot safer. Do you wear the, gloves? Pardon me? Do you wear gloves or does it irritate your skin? I know some of the guys wear gloves, but e even in the wintertime, I never, I, I cannot stand to wear gloves. 
So I'm not a glove wearer, but it it's never irritated me at all whatsoever. I think at one point they used to say advertise it that you could drink it and it wouldn't hurt you, but they kind of got away from that advertisement many years ago. <laughs> so I never wanted to try it. But uh, I, I think it's pretty safe, or else I wouldn't be here telling you guys about it. And on your sheet, I don't think you're supposed to drink it. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's. It's it, actually a drink biologically. And it's the product that they use in D.C. All the government yes. buildings, it's what they use at Arlington National Cemetery. D2 they do? D2 yes. is what they use. Now, when you go to their website, it will it will specify that the VA uses D2. But if you keep reading, and I don't know if you ever noticed it, but it will say other, other solutions used, and they'll they'll mention wet and forget. Yeah, anybody can go use it, but they're not going to use it. It's just like, I'm not going to use it. It's a lot cheaper. You can buy that wet and forget. You know, it's it's a third of the price of, of the D2. But also, over Winfield, I, I started experimenting using the D2 on limestone markers that, that I had made to their block markers to differentiate the, the different blocks of my cemetery. And I noticed after a few years, some of them was starting to, to eat away. Whether it was the wet and forget, I don't know, but I, I, I kind of leaned that direction. It was probably that wet and forget that was doing that to those limestone markers because limestone and white marble, pretty close to the same rock formation, just one was Limestone is uh, sedimentary rock, and I believe white marble, marble has been pressurized a little bit. Otherwise, it's the same calcium carbonate type material. Joe, if I may interject a little bit. Sure. In Wichita, as commander of the Patrick Coyne camp, uh, we had two particular cemeteries just north of Wesley. That would be the Highland Cemetery and the Walden Cemetery across the street from each other. We spent four years working on uh, all the stones that's in, uh, in Highland. Yeah. And if you drive, you can't help but see it when you drive by on, on, on uh, Hillside. There is the GAR plot near a mausoleum, and you can see those shiny stones just as you go by. And there is another mausoleum in Walnut where there's a circle. Uh, of uh, Civil War stones, some 200 of them, and the same thing applies there. It took us, oh, a better part of uh, two years to, just this last two years to do, to do uh, Walden Grove, so uh, they, it, it's the same thing I did in Arc City with, uh, with uh, Riverview, the GAR plot, 72 stones. I did the walk by, spray, and forget. Three months later, pristine, and uh, it does work. It just depends on how heavy the growth is that's on those stones. Sure. You guys use it on the metal fences or anything? Yes. Pardon me? You use it on metal, the fences or anything? No, you, know, you can. But when we go out into our cemetery work days, the only things, the only stones, markers we touch. Our, our VA markers. You know, we we don't touch, I, I walk by, I don't know how many uh, granite or, or marble markers that, you know, it might have a GAR emblem on it, but that's, that's a private headstone and without permission from the family, we're not gonna, we're not gonna touch that. But yes, it would work in, anywhere, I, I've tried it on my house, and you know, on the north side of my house, where I get a little mold growing, right. I've used it on, on the side of my house, and it, it works very well. Do you and, spray it off with your head or just like? No, just spray it and let it run off. Spray it to the point of runoff. Okay. Uh, on the sheets that you guys have out there, 
I, I believe down at the bottom, the lower right hand corner, I believe were underneath Atlas Preservation. It's either above or below Atlas Preservation. It says, uh, I believe it's CCUS, and that is the Cemetery Conservators for, what's it say, United? United Standards. Yes. And they are a group of guys, and I know, I know some of those guys, and what they do is they, they, they are into this cemetery, they are old school cemetery conservators. And so they vet about every product out there. And so you can go to their website or you can go to their Facebook page and you can see, they will tell you what you can use and what you should not use. And they, they are a good group, group of guys. And I, sometimes I get, get on there quite a bit and I'm kind of active on that side as well. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a good source of information if you want to know what you can use or if you should be or shouldn't be doing something. Hey, you know, when you use that D2 stuff on something that hasn't been around, it isn't real bad, but can it be used as a preventive thing to keep algae from accumulating on it somewhere down the road maybe? Yeah. I, I don't know if it has that type of a, like a resilient factor to it. For removal, for sure. Yeah, but it, it, will, it will take it off I believe it will keep it from growing, from growing anything else for an extended amount of time. All right. But I, I just don't know about if a, if a brand new VA marker goes out to the cemetery and you spray it from day one, quite, you know, I, I, I don't know how well it would keep it from growing. Or yeah. well, I was thinking about something that's maybe been there for a few years, but it's pretty good shape still. Yeah. I mean, when, when, when I'm out walking a cemetery, I just spray every VA marker I come across, whether it's fairly clean or if it's really dirty. And I, if, if that gentleman that is buried there is a, was a Confederate soldier, I will, if, if he has a VA marker on his grave, I will spray it as well, because he, he, he's an American too. Yep. I'll spray it on World War I vets, World War II, uh, in any of those VA markers, I just go ahead and spray as I'm walking by. And I will tell you that the early, early, early Civil War marker, I, I meant to say this earlier, but some of the original Civil War markers out there, they are not as wide. The ones you get now are the most common. They are 12 inches wide, I believe, is what they are. And some of the early, early, early ones were only about 10 inches wide, and instead of being four inches thick, they were about two and a half inches thick. So if you run across the Civil War marker that is smaller than the rest around that, in that area, that's gonna be an early one. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's no more questions, I'll turn it over to, to Eric, and he can tell you about his family that settled over here. Joe, what, yes. what are the bristles uh, on your brush made of? It's, it's a natural fiber. Okay, I just thought maybe you knew what the fiber was. No, no, I just, you know, there, there's been some debate on that because you go to Walmart and everything they have is going to be a nylon bristle brush. And the CCUS, they recommend natural bristle. Uh, now, I know there are some guys, and I, I have seen people use the, the red nylon brushes that you get at Walmart. And they were sitting there scrubbing on it, and it started leaving little chunks of red embedded into that white marble. And so I'm sure the, the white and blue bristle nylon brushes do the same thing. So, you know, you see, you see me, and if you want to come in after we're done here, before we go to the cemetery, if you want to touch that bristle brush, I mean, you, I was scrubbing my, heart, my arm pretty hard, and it, it wasn't hurting at all whatsoever. So, natural bristle. And you can, you can go to Atlas Preservation and buy kits. You know, if you just got one or two or three little marble markers you want to do as family, you know, you can go on their website and buy, you know, like a quart sprayer of D2 and a couple of brushes. And, and they, they sell plastic scrapers. I'm not going to buy a plastic scraper because 
I just recently had to retire and I'm broke. And so I just go out, <laughs> I just go out in my garage and, and get whatever scraps of wood I can find because that's a lot cheaper to use. But, you know, the, the, the thing about whatever scraper you use, you're not gouging at the material trying to get rid of the biological growth. You're just knocking the, the, the bigger chunks off so this D2 will penetrate what's left better. As Joe said, uh, my name is Eric Erickman and I am the Secretary Treasurer for the Eggers Camp in Winfield. In addition, I'm also the Eagle Scout coordinator at the camp level and then also uh, the department level with the state of Kansas. And uh, just a little more background, uh, the Department of Kansas, there's six camps in the entire state of Kansas. And the uh, Eggers Camp in Winfield is the youngest. There's also a camp in Wichita and one in Humboldt, uh, one uh, Overland Park, one Topeka, what am I forgetting? Uh, that's horrible. But anyways, there's, there's six of them in the entire state, and so I just want to share that with you all, that we're not just specific to Winfield, that they're, like Terry said, he's a past commander of the group in, in uh, Wichita, at coin camp, and so if any of y'all are interested, uh, we're always looking for your members, if anyone's interested, we're not uh, uh, putting one off, and so uh, I wanted to briefly share that with you before I get started on my family history. And uh, so, uh, and my parents are here tonight. My mother was a Bakken, and in 1870, there were two Civil War veterans that uh, out of Iowa that came to South Central Kansas, and it was Simon and John Botkin, and Simon is in my direct family line, and they were amongst, according to some genealogy, which ties into the historical and genealogical part of this group tonight, and uh, there was a story that was uh, written by a granddaughter and was published in the Monitor Press in 1913, and it was republished again in the Wellington Daily News in August of 1922 about when Simon came to Sumner County. And uh, so when one goes to searching for the origin of Sumner County history, the point of departure for the real beginning of things here, he's not long in discovering that there is no use of going back any farther than the time when Simon Bachman was one of the pioneers who came when everything was nice and new, just about as it left the Creator's hands. Before a heedless and perverse generation that came along to crisscross the fair face of nature with barbed wire fences that blew the free air of the prairies with the odor of gasoline and the dust of scorching automobiles. Among the noted and select class, the very first dispersed of the pioneers that broke the path and blazed the trail for the rest of the procession, Mr. Bachman stands just about at the head. As so I said, there was, there was uh, Simon and John was both Civil War veterans. Uh, it's a pretty incredible story, I, I've always thought, because they came in 1870, in September, and Simon homesteaded about five miles northwest of Wellington here on Slate Creek. And then John, where he took the plot, and where he homesteaded was on the south end of town, and there's a street on the south end of town, it's Walking Street. And for anyone that's local that knows that there's also a walking care facility, and that's pretty much where John Bachman uh, homesteaded um, So Simon was in uh, Company H, the 19th Regiment, the Iowa Infantry. John was Company G, the 7th Regiment of the Iowa Cavalry. And then a few years later, the rest of the family came, their father and mother and uh, sister and brother, and their father also served, and he was in Company H of the 3rd Regiment of the Iowa Cavalry. And where Simon homesteaded northwest of town, it was a couple years after, 1872-1873, there was a family that came from Illinois, and they had a daughter that Simon married. 
And so his father-in-law served in Company I, the second regiment of the Illinois Cavalry. And all four of these gentlemen are buried here in Wellington. They're all buried out at Prairie Lawn Cemetery. And so that was uh, one of the things when we found out about this group, and of course, interested in genealogy and history and family history, that uh, kind of drew me to this fraternal organization in addition to honoring all the veterans. And uh, so that's a little bit of the family history. The last name was Botkin, you said? Botkin, B-O-T-K-I-N. Is that the, the street down here, Botkin, yes, that's related to them? Right, right, Botkin Street. That's where John, he, he struck a claim down there in that quarter. And then his brother, that's Simon, that's of my lineage, direct lineage, he took a claim northwest of town, about five miles directly northwest mm -hmm. of Walmart Slate Creek. That's where he homesteaded. And I'd seen that uh, maybe it was a couple of years ago, there was a story about Sumner City that is no longer existing. It, it folded up shortly. Well, there was a, a competition for, for what was going to be the county seat of Sumner County. And there was a number of communities that tried to buy it to become the county seat. And Wellington ended up winning that. And Summer City, that was just north of where Simon homesteaded, uh, due to it not becoming the county seat, uh, and part of that with the politics, there was inducements made by some of the people of Wellington that if Summer City didn't get it, we'll, we'll give you plots in Wellington. And, you can move here. And so that's what happened. They actually took a number of those buildings and they moved them from five miles from the west of town into Wellington. And so, uh, but we got discovered a few years ago in a desk, and I don't remember seeing these very much when I was younger, but there's a Grand Army of the Republic badge that would have been Simon's. And uh, that would have most likely been his badge because all the members had badges. And in our group, we have a membership badge that we wear, denoting that we're members. And then uh, there's a little name badge, and he may have got that uh, when the conclusion of the war, uh, before they left Iowa to come down here, because they'd heard about the, the development of Sumner County and that they was making this land available. That, uh, basically, Sumner County and Cali County was laid out at the same time the Kansas legislature in 1868. Uh, and they opened it up and they was advertising to get people to move here. And so those two brothers decided, well, let's go down there and do some more venturing and started it off. And then uh, a number of the members, uh, family members that I mentioned, the four gentlemen, uh, they were members of the James Shields Post Number 57. Here in Wellington, and that was the Grand Army of the Republic post here in Wellington. And uh, basically, that was kind of a forerunner before we had foreign wars, and then we ended up having the VFW and the American Legion. That's what the Grand Army of the Republic was, it was a fraternal organization for the veterans. And uh, one of the things that the Grand Army of the Republic was, most of us know, that they was able to get done was they got uh, Memorial Day to become a federal holiday. And then Simon was also, for a brief moment, he or for a brief time, he was a prisoner. After the Battle of Vicksburg, he was with a group of men that went down farther in Louisiana to try and secure a bridge over the Atchafalla River. And from reports that I've read, uh, the Union forces was uh, well overwhelmed by the Confederate forces. And so the battle didn't last very long, and they weren't successful, and he was taken a prisoner. And, uh, I said some of the stories, that, reports that I've read, that uh, they took them to Shreveport, Louisiana, and then after that, they took them to a camp, or to a fort called uh, Fort Fort in Tyler, Texas, and there wasn't enough uh, security there to, to hold them, and so they ended up marching those Union uh, soldiers back and forth between Tyler, Texas and Shreveport, Louisiana. And, and in the process of that, uh, Simon was able to escape and he joined up with some other guys and 
He ended up, he mustered out down in Mobile, Alabama. He served the full service of the war and mustered out in 1865. But, uh, so it, it's always been a pretty unique story to me, especially that, you know, with the Civil War, it, it was brother against brother, but a lot of times there were brothers that would fight for the Union and some would fight for the Confederacy. And, and in this instance, there was, uh, and then there was another brother, Oscar, that uh, he ended up going to Oregon at the conclusion of the war. He was a medical doctor. He was studying medicine at the time when the war started, and he ended up going out to Oregon. But I thought that was a really neat, really neat situation when so many people died during the Civil War, and there was actually more people that died due to ill illness and health than what actually fought in battle. And in this instance, you had a father and three sons that, that fought and survived and went on to lead successful lives. So, but, uh, but yeah, from the, the history and, and information that I've gathered so far, Simon supposedly was amongst the very, or the first 20, supposedly, to, to Homestead and, and Sumner County, Kansas. And due to uh, drought conditions, I found one story I thought I'd share that I thought was fairly unique. And this was in the Monitor Press of Wellington, Kansas, in August 16th of 1916. And the article is, uh, Cattle prices in 1874 compared to the present. With cattle bringing practically six cents, a pound, six cents a pound on the hoof right here in Wellington, conditions are not quite so bad for the farmers as they were back in 1874, said Simon Bocking, which Simon's my two times great grandfather. One of the very firstest of the old settlers the other day. At that time, and for a number of years, after Wellington had no railroad, which told me our nearest shipping point, in 1874, the grasshoppers and the drought together made a clean sweep of everything in the shape of feed. There was no grass on the range, no corn at all, and scarcely any fodder or roughness, and the cattlemen either had to let their herds starve or else get them to market regardless of the price. Mr. Botkin says that he and his brother John Botkin, Jesse Jones, Luke Spencer, and a couple of other men started with a herd of several hundred to drive them through to Kansas City. They had with them paper signed by the Swiss Frogman, the then county clerk certifying that the cattle had been wintered in Sumner County, otherwise on account of the fear of Texas fever, they probably would not have been able to get through. They were held up several times as it was and threatened with all sorts of trouble, but managed to bluff and parlay their way to Kansas City. They sold some of the cattle in Kansas City, Missouri, and parted some new stockyards that had been started over on the Kansas side. But the results were so disappointing that they decided to ship the balance to St. Louis, which they did, receiving less for most of the shipment, and they had paid for the same animals here in Sumner County. The cattle industry has had its ups and downs since then, but things never got quite so bad as they did in the year of the grasshopper. So I thought that was kind of an interesting piece of history that I'd share with you all. So, um, So I think I'll just leave it at that. I don't know if any of you are interested in seeing any of this. If you do, let me give it out. But uh, it's just uh, some pretty interesting history and it was some stuff that was actually in a family desk that we really didn't even realize was there until my father decided to refurbish it and happened to open one of the drawers in the cigar box. All these items were in there. So, um, which was give me an opportunity to give a little plug. That's one of the things that our group wants to do is we want to get a hold of any of those GAO records. If you should happen to come across anything, uh, please by all means get in touch with us. We're, that's one of our missions is gathering those records and documentation. So in case you come across anything, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you.